tomorrow. System, yeah. Male reproductive system. Here's some basic parts. This is a uh, test. This is actually a test. Yeah. This is sort of misleading. This is the test. And then this part up here is the epididymis. It sort of comes up over around. The epididymis plus the test together is what makes up the test. Oh, so it's a, so little, bit, it's a little mislabeled, right? But the reality is, again, this is one of those things we just gave up on. Because people just call this the testicle, so like, okay, whatever. But technically, the testing plus the epididymis together makes up the testicle. This is where sperm are created. And they're constantly created. And they move into the epididymis. And then from the epididymis, they move into this next part called the vas deferens, or sometimes called the ductus deferens. Notice that this tube goes back into the pelvic cavity, behind the bladder, and into these V-shaped glands here called the seminal vesicles. It mixes with a lot of fluid in the seminal vesicles. About 70% of the semen is actually made of fluid from the seminal vesicles. And then that moves into a little duct here called the ejaculatory duct within the, in the prostate. This is the prostate here, right beneath the urinary bladder. Uh, that goes into the urethra, which then carries the ejaculate all the way out this way. You can see it in the nose. Sperm only makes up about 2% of uh, everything that's in the semen. Um, the scrotum is the sac of tissue that holds the testes. The, two the penis is uh, going to carry the urethra. And what's not on here is right here, there's something called the bulb urethral gland. And the bulb urethral glands secrete a little bit of fluid ahead of the semen. Listen to this, ladies, so that you understand what's going on in here. Because you don't. You don't know anything. Oh, well, technically, I will some. Okay. Maybe not this. Right. I'm teaching you this. That little bit of fluid that comes before the semen is called pre-seminal fluid. Although I think you probably know another term for it. Pre-cum. You didn't have to yell it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> so why does that happen? Well, remember the urethra of the males carries two things. It carries urine and it carries semen. The urine is very acidic. So there could be droplets of urine still within the urethra, stuck to the walls. So as the semen comes through, that, that acidic urine could be damaging to the sperm. So that little bit of fluid that's released from the bulb urethral glands, sometimes called the calvary glands, are right here, is going to come ahead of that fluid so as to neutralize the inside of the urethra. There's a reason for that. Because of the urine. You said the urine is acidic. Acidic, right. And because urine comes through the urethra, there might still be droplets of urine in the urethra. Yeah. I'm sure you, you ever drink a soda through a straw and you look down inside the straw, there's droplets of soda stuck to the inside of the straw. Mm -hmm. Okay, so think of it that way. It would be droplets, tiny droplets of urine that's still stuck to the inside of the urethra. So that little bit of fluid is going to come first and it's going to neutralize all that. So that it doesn't damage the sperm that's going to be coming through next. Not necessarily take it out, but just even, even. Neutralize it. Okay. Yeah. So, I bring this up because people often ask, well, can a woman get pregnant from just that fluid? Yeah. Well, it's a yes and a no answer. The fluid itself does not contain any sperm. However, the ejaculatory duct that is coming right to the prostate here can have sperm that is leaked forward from the several vesicles. Mm -hmm. So that sperm may have leaked forward a little bit more and got pushed along with that fluid. So. Can it have sperm in it? Technically, it can, but it's not likely to. But if there's a possibility, then there's a possibility of pregnancy. 
when a man gets a vasectomy, or as I call it, a vasectomy, this right here, look at the picture up on the wall, please. Mm -hmm. This right here is where it gets cut. The epidermis. No. The ball? The vasectomy. Oh, the vasectomy. So all you do is you go in with a little bit of lidocaine and numb this area up, the skin, and cut through the skin, and then cut out on both tubes, so section and tubing. And then why did the ends? So that the is the ends. a surgical excision of the vasectomy. Yeah, vasectomy. So that way the sperm that's created here won't make their journey along this way and out like here. So the sperm just stays there in the testes. Yeah, and then they just get broken down, reabsorbed. Oh, okay, okay. And actually, sperm is stored in the vasectomy well, so yeah. for months. Listen to this. For months, sperm is stored in here. So even after that person has that surgery done, they still have to go a couple of months using protection because there's still sperm stored all up through the vast effort. But then once that's done, once that's over with, yeah, no more sperm will come from here. But all those sperm will just get broken down, reabsorbed, and no big problem. Could they save it? Because is the sperm still decent? Yeah. Like they can eventually go. Well, it'd be easier to save it before anything. Mm -hmm. But what did they choose? Like, hey, I want to do my my um, sperm cell at least three more. Like okay. This. Well, they still can. They'd have to extract it. But they're yeah. Really diff difficult. Okay. They're but difficult. anytime somebody's considering having this done. I always tell them, consider this to be permanent. Mm -hmm. Don't consider, don't say, well, I can always get it reversed. Because if you're thinking like that, then don't do it. Then yeah. don't do it. Then just forget it. Mm -hmm. Consider it permanent. Because, yeah, we could reverse it. And it's an easier reverse than reversing the females. And with much greater success. But don't, if you're going to go through that process, why go through all that discomfort if you're just going to have it reversed anyway? So you said it would, it would take a couple months after the vasectomy for the actual sperm to deplete. Yes. And then from then on, it's the just from then on, it would just be seminal fluid. Yes, and fluid from the prostate gland. Um, so what that means is, honestly, uh, it wouldn't look any different. It wouldn't feel any different. Everything about it would be the same. The only thing that would be different is if you looked at it under a microscope. Is that 2%? You wouldn't see any sperms from the ground. But everything else would be exactly the same. This is an easier process than on the female. This is a better option. It's less invasive, uh, less chances of complications. It's easier. Mm. Mm. All right, let's look at the system. Does testosterone, is it not released as much or not not present as much when you get a vasectomy? No, it's nothing to do with that. Okay. Although testosterone is made uh, in the testes, yeah, that's it's not like carried it. by the vas deferens. Gotcha. Yeah, it's made by um, interstitial cells. And those interstitial cells are going to release it into the blood. So the blood supply is going to be the same. That's not going to change. Gotcha. Uh, the gonads are the two testes. Now, of course, some people might have just one. Um, one testy is plenty, still making lots of sperm. They just naturally have one? They might naturally have one, or they may have had that one surgically removed. Uh, if it did not, if it, caused, if it was cancerous or if it did not um, move correctly into this position or if there was torsion of it or some other problem. A penis, scrotum, the scrotum is the sac of tissue that holds the testes. Uh, as I said, the epididymis is that part of the tube that sits on top of the testy. Uh, it is going to be the first collection site of all of the sperm that is coming from the testes, the little ducts, what are called seminiferous tubules. Uh, it is going to be a place where sperm is going to get sorted a bit. 
and they're going to uh, also, well, get rid of like defective ones. The prostate is that walnut-sized and shaped gland that sits beneath the, ur beneath the urinary bladder. The seminal vesicles are the two V-shaped parts that are located on the posterior aspect of the bladder and the bulbourethral glands, sometimes called the Cowper's glands, are the ones that are going to release that pre-ejaculate fluid. The perineum is the area between the scrotum and the anus. Uh, it's a good term to know because it's exactly the same in the female. Between the vulva and the anus, it's still called the perineum. Talk about the scrotum already, talk about the testes already, talk about the penis. The testes has these seminiferous tubules. This is where sperm are constantly being formed. As I said, the epididymis is also going to store some sperm, um, sort some sperm. In other words, help get rid of some defective ones. The interstitial cells are the cells in the testes that make testosterone, the most abundant and biologically active of the male hormones. Uh, the spermatic cord is sort of a wrapping around all of those components that go down to the testes, including the testes itself. So your sperm would be infected? Did you say what you said about the sperm? Right. Did you say Defective. Oh, defective. Defective. What, what makes it defective? Not so strong. Not a complete flagellum. There are flagellums here, the little tail. Um, uh, okay. It might be connected to another sperm, didn't separate completely. Mm. So if there's two sperm, that gets broken down and gotten rid of, but if there's two eggs, the same thing doesn't happen. Correct. Interesting. So two sperm will never happen, like it'll never get past. To connect with sperm. Well, the, it might get past the epididymis. But meaning it won't take it to the egg together. Right. Interesting. Yeah, because there's, you know, in that ejaculate, there's anywhere from 100 million to 500 million sperm on the That's a lot. Especially um, when making two percent. By the time it gets to the actual egg, there's only like dozens yeah. left. So only the strongest and the best ones are going to survive that journey. Uh, there's a lot of things along the way that's going to knock them out. Mm -hmm. And if they're weakened already like that, they'll never make that journey. Gotcha. So, you know, they destroyed long before that. Mm -hmm. Functions of testosterone. Stimulate spermatogenesis. That's a good term. Spermatogenesis. What does genesis mean? The beginning. The beginning, creation. So the creation of the sperm. Stimulates development of male sexual secondary uh, characteristics. Hair growth, for instance. Increased sex drive. Nice. All right, spermatogenesis is going to start out with these germ cells that are going to go through a process called uh, meiosis, which is different than mitosis. Because what's eventually going to happen is one of those germ cells is going to actually become four separate sperm cells. And this is constantly happening in the testes, well, from puberty on. Constantly happening. So rather than go through the process, I just want you to hear that. One germ cell is eventually going to become four separate sperm cells. Each of those sperm cells is going to have a total of 23 chromosomes. One copy of chromosome one, one copy of chromosome two, one copy of chromosome three, et cetera, et cetera, and then either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. In this process, from going from this to this, from the one cell to four cells, in that process, there's a lot of shuffling of genetic material that happens, like with shuffling cards. This is how different genetic traits become apparent. 
I already just mentioned torsion, didn't I? Um, torsion? Testicular torsion is when a testy can twist. Yeah, I've heard of that. Why is that bad? Because then the vast difference is cut, twisting. Well. Yes, but what else? Blood supply is twisted. If blood supply gets twisted, then there's no blood going to the testy. Oh, goodness. So, what do we have to do to fix this? Oh, How? We don't have to just move it. <laughs> well, you might have to go in surgically. And so we're depending on how yes. how the how bad is twisted. Yes. Woo wee! How do you eat? Oh wait, that mean the ball is twisted. Where? Testy. Um, it's twisted. They need something. They don't have they don't have some handle problems. And then what's going <laughs> and then what's gonna happen to that testy? Blood well, it's going to die and fall off. So how long is that going to take? Fall off. He didn't deny that. <laughs> that six I was hours. expecting him to be like, huh? How long is that going to take? Uh, six hours. It's going to go about six hours. About to me. But just so you know, the same thing can happen to an ovary. Yeah. Uh, it can torsion as well. Oh, goodness. Uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about very oh, that's sealed later on. Yeah, about well, that. that's how it's pronounced. Cryptorchiasm. Uh, what you need to realize is that the testes start out in the pelvic cavity. When that person, that boy, is developing the uterus, the testes actually develop in the pelvic cavity and then move through the inguinal canal to bring the spermatic cord with it, with all the blood supply and the vas deferens and everything. They move through the inguinal canal and down into the scrotum. I don't like that. That's weird. It's all weird. It's what happens. However, this is supposed to happen about a month before birth. However, you said before birth? Yeah. If it doesn't happen, you then we have an issue. Yeah. Oh, y'all don't, y'all don't, y'all can't, I want to say it not because. Cryptorchiasm. If yeah, one or both general. testes fails to descend. Oh, but y'all can fix it. Yes. And we would have to. Surgically. It's called orchiopexy. We'd have to. However, and this is what's important. If they don't descend on their own, or even if we have to surgically descend them, which is usually done within the first year, in fact, in the first six months, They'll start making plans for surgery if they haven't descended. I thought that happened. But if they've not descended on their own, that increases the risk of testicular cancer for that person, that man, young man. Testicular cancer happens at a young age, between 15 and 35 years old. It's a young person's cancer. So I say it's important because if this happens, mom has to know that she has to pass that information on to her son, that he has to be extra vigilant. Oh, I understand what you're saying. Making sure when he turns, gets closer to that teenage years, that he's watching. Because we teach young men how to check for testicular cancer. Same way we teach women how to check for breast, breast cancer. cancer. But are we really expecting women to know how what breast cancer looks like? No. No. I hope not. We're really expecting a 15 year old or a 16 year old. To diagnose cancer? No. No, what are we telling them to do? Check the symptoms. Look out for the symptoms. Yeah, regular. Yeah, anything that's different. <laughs> and if there's things that's different, go to somebody and let them know. So we're telling, we teach them to look for any changes, anything yeah, that's different, yeah. and then tell somebody about it. Same idea with women. Um, because if a testy has cancer, that's very dangerous. But the good news is we can just remove the testy. Because how many are there? Two. Two. Yes. Only need one. They'll actually put in a prosthetic where they remove the one. What is what is the Is it the balance? Is it is it the balance it out? Is it the balance it out? Testy, okay. Well, it looks like a ball. 
Is it about now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would think that. <laughs> no, for a while. Okay, so this is what the fake balls? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Professionalism <laughs> points everywhere. Yeah. Um, it's it's always interesting to me when we discuss things like this. Um, and you hear about those situations where a uh, woman has been unkind to her man. Um, oh, and she, uh, and she cuts off she his penis yeah. or something like that. that she put him it's always interesting to me when we talk about things like this with a room full of women, how women often laugh and laugh and laugh. But if I said the same thing about removing a breast what? because of cancer, suddenly that's not funny. No, and no. what you need to understand is you're entering the medical field so that none of this is funny. It's not yeah. funny when somebody has to have something removed or if something is removed. Um, because that's kind of a big deal, whether we do it or somebody else does it. It's kind of a big deal. So, if we have this young man who has have to have a testy removed, I mean, oh, wow. obviously he, it's going to be incredibly self-conscious. He's going to feel well different, and he's going to think other people are going to feel different. He's, he's concerned about how he's going to feel later on, and the reality is. It's not going to make any difference in them. But that's why they could put in a prosthetic because it's just cosmetic. It just makes it look like it's normal and feels yeah, normal. And that way, later on, he's not feeling self conscious about it. That's why I asked about the, the um, testosterone because I wasn't sure if that had to do with the hormone production. No, it'll still, it'll still, be, still make plenty, even if a testy is removed. Do they put that in like right after they take the other one out? They could. Easily, yes. Or we'll do they they, that wait until wait. Yeah, that way you don't have to wait. They wait, they, they do wait for it to like heal. Yeah. yeah. And, and, they, and they have a tissue cool. around them, they might like the first Or if they think cool that they, they might have to go back and remove the first tissue. Is so cool. yeah, but it's easy just to do it all at the same time. Mm -hmm. But it's a young man's cancer, 15 to 35. Uh, that's scary. Is it possible for anybody older than you? I, I hear you say. Is it possible for anybody older than you? Yeah, but it's less, less, less common. Yeah, the numbers decrease considerably after the age of 35. Then we got to start worrying about other cancers. So, prostate into the 40s and then colon into the 50s. Uh, epididymitis. Epididymitis. Inflammation of the epididymis. Inflammation of the epididymis. Probably uh, due to infection. Probably due to sexually transmitted infection. Like gonorrhea yeah. or chlamydia. Orchitis, inflammation of the testes. What or, or, or means? Orchitis, testes. It can be caused by trauma. It can be caused by infection. The most common infection I want you to know about is mumps. Mumps? Mumps. When you think of orchitis, just think of mumps virus. Mumps. Is there different mumps? Which different mumps is there? I don't know Yeah, so put those two together in your head. So I mean we're seeing more and more outbreaks, right? Of measles and mumps and other stuff that should have been vaccinated against. So to get some young four-year-old or five-year-old kid who is screaming in pain, his scrotum is really swollen, you got to keep this into consideration, especially if there's swelling in other places, like in their face, and the gland, something like that. Um, and then to find out that they, the family just immigrated from Eastern Europe or something, uh, then you have to consider, uh, oh, this could be something. Yeah. And I already talked about testicular cancer. Oh, I already talked about stacked. Uh, you know what sperm are? Adds to form of testicle, testicular. Oops. Just listen. Uh, 
um, spermatogonia is a term that you would hear. I don't know why they don't have it here. And those are the actual sperm cell, spermatogonia. Oh, I don't have they should. I would just call it sperm. Yeah, I can talk about there. We talked about meiosis um, already. We talked about orchitis. We're going to talk about varicocele later on. Epididymo orchitis. Yeah, I can talk about that. You can figure that one out, right? Yes. What is epididymo or orchitis? Inflammation of the epididymis and the testes. There you go. What about STD? Sex STD. Sexually transmitted disease. Yes. What was SET? SET? So, oh, self exam. Oh, okay, okay. Breast penis. Oh, I would say TSE, testicular self exam. Not SET, I would say testicular. PSE, just a good self exam. Just like we say, BSE, breast self exam. Um, and then what did I want to find about my shape? First, let's start off with. We can't really see it. Um, What's the most common sexually transmitted disease? Chlamydia. Yeah, more common. Chlamydia. Chlamydia. Chlamydia is caused by bacterium. Uh, chlamydia trachomatis, which is an intracellular bacterium. Notice how it's going into the cell and causing the problems in the cell. And then leaving. There's an intracellular bacteria, chlamydia trachomatis. It is very common. There are people in this building right now who are walking around chlamydia. Because not only is it common, it is often asymptomatic in males. And even asymptomatic in females. Meaning? Meaning, no, you know, they might not know they have it. Yeah. They have no signs or symptoms of it. So, at what point can you find out that you have it? I'm sorry? At what point would those people who are walking around asymptomatic find out that they have chlamydia? When they get tested for it. Wow, so they could go on and on and on if they don't. They can find out six months down the line. Yes. Which is why it's bad because then it can ascend up into the uterus and the blood feeding tubes and all that yeah. stuff. Inflammatory disease. Hmm. And that's bad. Yeah, it's good to go through the doctor. Even randomly. Uh, the way we treat chlamydia trachomatis is with an antibiotic. We can use doxycycline or very, very easy. We can give one big gram of azithromycin. It's a thousand that? milligrams. It's one big tablet of azithromycin. If you don't know what azithromycin is, it's the pecomacolide antibiotic that you find in the Z pack. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The, the ones that you right. take two the first day and then you take one yeah. every day after that for the next four days. It's a really good antibiotic. I don't like taking medicine. Um, it's the nice thing about this is that in this case they would just take one pill, one big, one thousand milligrams, one gram. Not six hundred twenty more gram pills aren't that big. Yeah. Let's see it. 
I don't see it like compared to anything else. Like in someone's hand. The actual size. Yeah. Yeah, type in actual size. Are oh, you get say so you get a no, I work at a pharmacy where it was in fact. So I never see this one. You can actually adopt it from like it's nothing. Yeah. It's an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Like what is that? I'm really sick. Can I have this infection? It's a it's a broad spectrum antibiotic that works really well. In fact, have you ever got um the E tabs? No. Oh, okay. Um, because it falls in the same category. So if you're going to treat something with a knee tab, it can recognize it, you can treat it with a different one. How would you launch, like, what would be the reason? Because I can give erythromycin and make sure that I take it twice a day for the next 10 days. Here, this with is erythromycin, the I give them one of these packets. They take two pills the first day at the same time, and they take one pill the next day, every day, for four days until they're done. This is for, like, a fever and stuff? It could be good for chlamydia, except we don't do it this way. For chlamydia, we just do one big pill of it, a thousand milligrams. But that's it. That's all they have to take. They're done. Why? But then we have to treat their partners also. Otherwise, they just keep giving it back and forth. Why? Okay. Well, I mean, why do, um, well, no, not why. How can we allow? Like mm, people with risky sexual <coughs> habits to take the Z-Pack as anti-viral. Okay. Hold, hold on. First of all, they don't take the Z-Pack for it. Not for chlamydia. They take one pill of azithromycin. Uh -huh. Not a Z-Pack. One pill, which is a 1,000 milligram pill. All at once. So if they don't, if your body can build an immunity to any, it does not. Your body doesn't build an immunity to antibiotics. Oh. Bacteria build an immunity to antibiotics. Your body does not, because the antibiotic does not affect you. It affects the bacteria. Okay. All your body does is metabolize and gets it ready for use, but. It doesn't affect you, so people don't get um, <laughs> get a tolerance to antibiotics. So what is it that they? Well, I've seen where um, gay men request not so much the cocktail um, antiviral and antibiotics, and they don't have. HIV or anything. They take it because they are at risk. They take it prophylactically. Yeah. yeah, because if a person is exposed to HIV, the faster you start the antiviral cocktail, the less likely it will convert. The virus will convert in the body. Convert meaning um, actual take hold, actual start to grow and grow and grow. So if they, they take it prophylactically, thinking that they're probably going to get exposed to it. So at least this way, it will decrease the chances that it will convert the bodies, that they'll actually get infected with it. Well, why don't they just make it a vaccination? Because it's not really a good idea to do that for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, we don't want the virus to mutate to where it no longer works. Oh, okay. And that's where um, tolerance is created. That's why we want to be very specific. That's why we have so many different antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Because we want to give an antibiotic that's specific to that bacterium. Because if it's only a little, if it only works a little bit, or sort of works, well then over time that bacteria is going to build a resistance to it. It won't work at all. That's why you'll hear me use the term broad spectrum antibiotic, because that works a, that works well for a lot of different types. And that's what the, the macro line, the uh, as a device it is, it's a broad spectrum of it. Uh, yes. Because it's decreasing the likelihood, along with other things as well. 
you know, like using condoms, for instance. But that doesn't protect against, you know, things like herpes. And you still get herpes. Wait, condoms don't protect against herpes? No. Because no. con the herpes vesicles can occur on the scrotum. Scrotum doesn't get covered by a condom. So now you have um, a herpes vesicle that is coming in contact with a mucous membrane. And now you Yeah. Or general warts. They can happen on the scrotum as well. So. That was just chlamydia we were talking about. That's an easy one. Neisseria gonorrhea is what causes gonorrhea. This is a bacterial infection. In men and women, the symptoms are similar. They will have painting or burning upon urination. The signs are similar. They will have a yellowish to greenish color discharge. This is why I got the nickname the drips. <laughs> the clay. Wait, what's clay? Garlic. Gonorrhea is the clap. Okay. It's clay effect. It's not really clear why gonorrhea got the nickname the clap. There's lots of different theories. The one that most people agree on is that because it was, it, or not because, but it was first discovered in France, in this area of Paris, by a doctor who noticed that these women had these same signs and symptoms, and they all worked in a red light area, a red light district, an area of prostitution. Um, that area of town was called the Clapier. <laughs> so they nicknamed it the disease of the Clapier. So that when American soldiers were there in World War I and World War II, and they were infected with it, the doctors would tell them, oh, you have the disease of the clapier, oh. which of course, Americans being Americans, just shortened it to the clap. But people think the clap is chlamydia because it sounds similar, but it's not. The clap is gonorrhea. Now, if people have gonorrhea, they generally know they have gonorrhea. They didn't know something is wrong. Pain, burning during urination, Discharge, very right? disgusting discharge. If a person tests positive for gonorrhea, we automatically treat them for chlamydia. We don't have to test for it. Because if they have gonorrhea, they probably have chlamydia. That's how common chlamydia is. But the good news is one injection of ceftriaxin, one injection of this antibiotic, is all that's needed to treat gonorrhea. So that means we could treat this patient in one office visit. Give them one injection of ceftriaxin and one big giant pill, zithromycin, and that's it, they're done. But of course, you have to treat their partners. Otherwise, they'll just keep giving it round and round and round. And that's not good. And there's actually strains of gonorrhea now that are becoming somewhat resistant. Painless ulcer, canker. What did they say? Look for herpes in three. Painless? Three, right? 
burpees can come in clusters. This will look like a cigar burner. Oh, yeah. Or, and it's um, painless, which is yeah. a big clue. Somebody has something like this on their genitalia and it doesn't hurt them. It looks like it hurts, but if it's not, that's a big clue. It so, do they have to remove them? Ah, look at that vagina. Can you see that over? Do you see it? Oh, man. All the way to the right. That's not so. That's Kamalamata Kumanata. That's actually works. <laughs> This is what I can do to bone over time. Primary syphilis shows up on the genitals first. Secondary syphilis can show up on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. But the thing about this is, when this guy, for instance, in this case, gets this painless canker, this ulceration, that's going to be there. I don't know, seven to ten days maybe? What? It's going to be there seven to ten days maybe. But then it's going to go away. What's he going to think? Oh, I'm good. Exactly. That's nothing. And that's bad because then it goes into the next stages where it shows up with that rash on the feet or on the palms of the hand. And then it starts to affect the joints and the bone. There's a latent stage where it sort of is dormant for a while and then affects the brain, the tertiary stage. That's crazy. Huh? It causes them to go crazy and die. Well, because they ignored that little blister. Yep. And it's an easy fix. One shot of penicillin. Penicillin G. We can do That's crazy. Maybe we just want to get pills just because. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an easy fix. But if they ignore it, it becomes a big problem. And eventually it will kill them. This is what killed. And we don't make antibodies for that sort of stuff, right? So just keep Correct. Back. Not, not, not that it will take care of them. Why don't, why don't we create antibodies for things like STDs? Our body does it has to. But it's Gotcha. Um, this is what killed Al Capone. Really? The original star case. No way. Uh, it is. He wanted to be two gangsters. So what's his RV like in your bones and stuff? Is that you could do? You just kind of got to like bleed it out or something? I have no idea. You just ask. Um, when it gets to your bones. Ask them again. Can you hear me? You can't hear me. I, I, I can't hear you. Oh, um. Once it's like past the stage, like we said, once it's the bump, you can um, fix it. But once it's like in the bones and stuff, like you said, it's nothing you can do to um, fix it or stop. No, you can still treat it. Oh. Even when it gets to the brain, it's just less less treatable, and any damage that has occurred is yeah, done. At what point are you like, all right, just get comfortable? Like their their nose will fall off. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> That was an unnecessary addition. Wow. I don't like that. This, is yeah, that where Dr. Noah's came from? Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, that's, that really does look like it. Who's that? Is that where Dr. Noah's came from? Oh my god, it's so weird. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think that's right. <laughs> what the? <laughs> Understand this. Back in the um, 1500s, early 1500s in Italy, they were already coming up with different ways to fix the nose. That's how prevalent this was. And that's how much damage it did to the person's face. That is crazy. That they were already practicing uh, reconstructive surgery to replace the nose that had been damaged by syphilis. So, I mean, imagine. You go through your life with your nose off like that, people know why. Yep. Um, that is the stigma that goes along with that is enough to make you think, all right, I want to get my nose fixed. 
Yeah, but at that point, the amount of scarring that your face in general has to Well, have, the idea is that you don't let it get to this. Oh my gosh. Salt? Um, what, makes it, what, what makes a target such specific, like... You said Uncle Paul? Can we Uncle Paul? Yeah, that's what's that. It doesn't seem to be. And Jack the Ripper, right? Well, we can't say Jack the Ripper had it because we don't know who Jack the Ripper really was. We don't really know, but the person that they think. We don't what? They say Uncle Paul died of pneumonia following his drink from her foot. He has his voice. This, this is the result of a child born to a mother. Oh, yeah, yeah, he showed us that. These little tech shaped teeth. Much of his teeth. That's so And here's some general herpes. Herpes simplex virus type 2. Did you get on your finger? Yes, that's likely. More likely like this. What's that in the mouth? This is the penis. Um, they will tell you these hurt. Unlike the syphilis, which is painless, these hurt and they reoccur. So they come back. It could be every couple of months. The idea is when we do that medication, the cyclovir or famcyclovir, the idea is that that's going to increase the length of time between outbreaks and decrease the length of time of an outbreak. Now, I have a question. So it doesn't make it go away. I have it doesn't a fix it. This is here forever. So is the cyclovir a topical? It can be. But not for this reason. So um, is. The um, what is it called? Valtrex, is that a cyclovir? Valtrex, that's a famous cyclovir. Same family drugs. You can see up here. So. So, yeah. so what is the difference between herpes simplex virus type 1 and herpes simplex virus type 2? The location? Well, yeah. But they are different viruses. Herpes simplex virus type 1 wants to stay around the mouth. Herpes simplex virus type 2 wants to stay around the genitals. So can you outgrow one? No. Like if it's juvenile. No, if it's there, it's there. So a juvenile that gets it. So it will always have it. And that will pop up any time. But it usually pops up during times of stress. And that doesn't just that doesn't mean emotional stress necessarily. Um, but physical stress. Maybe they have the flu. So when they have the flu, they end up also getting a cold sore or a fever blister. That's the term. That's herpes simplex virus type 1. It will keep coming back throughout their lifetime. 
If a person had a cold sore at one point in time in their life, they'll probably have another one at some point in time in their life. However, the outbreaks tend to get better. In other words, they're not as severe. The first one's usually the most severe. And the time in between them gets longer. What so do you mean? It, it gets longer. The time in between outbreaks gets longer. Oh, so they won't have it as frequent. Correct. So they may have gotten a cold sore and then like two years later get another one. Oh, it's like that. And then like ten years later get another one. And then like thirty years later get another one. And each one is less and less severe. So. The question that I always get asked is, well, what if a person who has herpes simplex virus type 1 up here, what if they were performing some specific act on another person? Could that cause them to get herpes simplex virus type 1 down here? Yes. But it's still herpes simplex virus type 1. It's still the oral herpes, it's just down here. And then that will go away, and then they may get one outbreak after that, maybe two at the most ever, usually no more than one. Um, and then they'll never get herpes simplex virus type one down here again. But they can get herpes simplex virus type two down here. So let me let me explore. Let me explain this again. Herpes simplex virus type one is up here. If they perform some act on somebody, they could pass that on down here, but it's still type 1. It just happens to be on the genitals of the other person. But then it'll go away, and it may never come back, or they might have one outbreak or two at the most ever down here, but they won't have more than that. So then the virus... And then they'll never, ever get type 1 down here again. Then they'll be immune to it down here. But will they now have type, type 1? No, okay. it doesn't become type 2. Okay. That's why I see these are two oh. different viruses. Type 1 is here, type 2 is here. They like to stay there. Can a person get type 1 down here? Yes, as I just mentioned, mm -hmm. that can happen. Can a person get type 2 up here? Yes. yes. But we usually see that in immunocompromised individuals, like with HIV or AIDS. And then they happen to have gotten in contact with somebody who had you know, HSV2 and got them up here. So they don't like to switch. They like to be here. Type 1 likes to be here, type 2 likes to be here. But they can. So we do create antibodies for herpes type 1? We do. Mean? But that doesn't mean that it gets rid of it. Yeah. But you're saying so you can't get herpes type 1 on the genitals again. I'm not me. Stop saying we. I said we. Oh, stop saying we. We're not like that. We're a good class of people. Well, yeah. I'm saying that if a person had gotten type 1 down here, they might have another outbreak after that down here. They might even have two outbreaks after that. But usually they don't. Usually they'll have one at the most other outbreaks. And then they make enough antibodies. And then they're immune to ever getting that down here again. Gotcha. Yeah. It's weird how that works out. Because I had to look up and read about it. Yes. So, if they get to the outbreaks, like they're not freaking out then, like, if they get tested for herpes, will it still show up? They can still show up, yes. So, they will still know if they get it. Because they can still find the antibodies to it. Oh. To say they've at least been exposed to it. Right. And you told me that? Yeah. But usually, if people come in when they're having an outbreak. And that's all seeing if they come in when they're not, it will still tell you. If we, if we do blood work, yeah. yeah. But I've had to make those first diagnosis of these young people with general vesicles down here and say, yeah, that's general herpes. It's terrible hearing it. Mm. It's terrible telling it, people would. Imagine being that person who's 20 years old oh, man. who says, oh yeah, I got it from that person, but I didn't even like that person that much. Oh, no. Didn't really know the person that much. We were just drinking, we were just smoking a little bit, and it just happened. And now they get to think about that person for the rest of their life, every single time they have an outbreak. And every time they go to date somebody, they get to announce this. I 
while they were there having outbreaks. Um, Why would people but they, they could to decrease the likelihood of outbreaks. But um, I, from what I've read, it's most effective when they're having an outbreak. But uh, right. especially like topical. Mm -hmm. But if they're taking it every day, the idea is to help decrease the likelihood of an outbreak happening. But it's not it's not like okay, but it's not like you're gonna stop it forever. That's why there's still a little bit of question as to how effective that is. Um, compared to, you know, you have, what you have to do is you have to get a group of people who have herpes who do not take the medicine every day, and then you have to get a group of people with herpes who do take the medicine every day, and then compare them and say, okay, who has more outbreaks? Well, it's hard to do that because that would bring these other people to be like, well, wait a minute, I don't want to take the medication every day just in case. So it's hard to get good data on how well that works. I want to just tell them to take the data. Like, just don't tell them it's somebody else when they're taking it every day. Let's just focus on what you're doing and see how okay you're Yeah, about. right. But but a person would say, well, this hurts, though. Oh. Why don't, why don't you just give me medication that you take every day that you decrease the likelihood? So there's still a little bit of controversy as to how effective that actually is, taking it every day. Okay. Um, because they're so sporadic. I mean, it's not like you know there's going to be an outbreak coming up July 19th. Oh, okay. So let's see if it does or not. You can't really time it like that. Oh. So instead, if you say, well, I'll take it every day, um, but then when you're having an outbreak, you know, make sure you're taking it, and plus you use this um, ointment as well. And then during that time, they can say, okay, well, that worked better than the last time I had an outbreak when I didn't have any medication. Like the first operation. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Okay. So I learned that the herpes virus um, hides in your sperm, in the bottom of your sperm. It doesn't hide. The virus does not hide in the body. This is a misnomer. What a virus does is it takes its directions and inserts them into your directions. So it takes, for instance, its DNA and puts it into your DNA. So now the virus isn't there anymore, but its information is. So when the cell is reading through its DNA and it's following the directions of all these pages, it gets to this page, what's it do? It brings it to them. It follows the directions, exactly. It doesn't, it's like if I broke into a bakery. People are like, yeah, I can see that happening. Thanks a lot. If I broke into a bakery and I took all my recipes on the stuff that I wanted the bakery to make that it didn't make, and I snuck in and I inserted all my recipes into their recipe book, and then I left. When the bakers came in and started following the directions of the recipe book, they would be making all the stuff that I wanted them to make. So it's not that the virus is hiding. The virus left its information there. So now it's just a matter of time when the cell gets to that point and says, oh, okay, I've got to follow these directions. And it remakes the virus. How convenient is that? People say hiding because it makes sense. Just like when they say blood thinners, thin the blood. I'm sorry? I don't I don't know. It don't matter. I didn't mean to crush anything. I'm just trying to explain things as they actually happen. Um, and, it, and it does do this in nerve cells. And of course... Is it in the spine at least? Let me, let me at least get that right. Is it in the spine? <laughs> no. um, it's more about in the nerves at the base of the spine. Okay. So not the spine, not the yeah, not the spinal the base, cord, the not the spinal cord, not the, not even necessarily like at the bottom, but like the spinal cord as it travels down through here has branches that come off 
all the way down. And when those branches come off, there's a group of ganglia cells there. So it's in those areas. Does it make it sound, say, the base of the spinal? That makes it sound like it's way down here. Well, then how is that virus going up here? Well, because it's in the nerves that are up here. And the ones that are down, it's in the nerves that are down there, the other one. That's why I say they like these areas or specific for those areas. But it's in those nerve cells. Which is why when it makes copies of itself, it spreads out following those nerve cells, those nerves and the nerve endings. Which is why it erupts on the skin. We see like the chickenpox virus erupt on the skin because the chickenpox virus was in the nerve cells. It erupts on the skin and it causes that painful rash we call what? Chickenpox. No. No, after chickenpox is gone. Oh, shit. Years later, shingles. That's why it hurts so much. Those nerves that are in pain. I just realized this whole time that that was of a phone case. Well, it was a phone this case. whole time, I'm like, why does it look so weird? It looks like there's a camera on there. Oh, it's because it's a phone case. That is weird. General Herpes Galaxy on a, on a case. Volvo. <laughs> why? It's calling so everybody. I'm going to be emailing Galaxy later. Is that the internet? Oh, this is yeah. the, Neither this did I at first. I was just sitting here like, yo, that is a gold case. That's the labia menorah. And wow. Wait, it holds agents. Interesting. This is perfect. Yeah. Phone yeah. case, five bucks, guys. Yeah. Anus, mouth. Mucous membrane. Oh my goodness. And I, I cannot believe I just saw that. Well, I shouldn't say that because it can't because it can affect the nerves around the eye, but not as much herpes as like the chicken pox or the shingles. That's more likely to. That's when it gets dangerous when that shingles happens on the face. Because then it can be a problem. Mono. Mono. Infection it's called infectious mononucleosis. Caused by the Epstein Barr virus. I did not know that. Epstein Barr virus can do a lot of things. Remember, if we don't know what causes something, we bring on a virus, if we don't know what virus. Never think somebody will get a Epstein Barr virus. They can affect the spleen in very dangerous things. Wow. Ew. Oh my god. Oh wow, I couldn't recognize that at first. Yeah, what's that tell you? It's mm. bad. <clears throat> so what all of those um it's spots got touched it's and five. Yeah. Oh These are all messes and stuff. So what's that tell you? Oh, they're genital warts and yep. these are these are all messes. Oh. I would say the general works are some vesicles. And the way you can tell the difference real fast is because vesicles are red around the base. Oh. And these are full of clear fluid. Whereas general warts can be the same color. I'll show you. People like really let it get this bad. That's what blows my mind. I see one real weird freckle pop up on my body and I'm freaking out. <coughs> These are not. What is that? These are not general words. These are. That's her view? Yeah. That looks like little teeth. This is actually normal. Around the corona of the penis. It's just kind of sort of large. I don't know what that's called. But. Um, and you can tell the, the regularity of the size of the not just a condo or mono. Condo or mono, even not. That's another one that I don't quite understand. HPV. HPV is what causes general works. Even top of the virus. But for that virus, they can vaccinate. But it's, uh, well, actually, 
And I heard it sets the meeting calls for cervical cancer. Yeah. But here's what you need to understand that people don't understand. See, that's a lot of time and a lot of energy. Ah. Um, here's what people don't understand. There's they've identified about a hundred different strains of HPV. Of human papillomavirus. Not all of them cause genital warts. Some of them cause warts on the hand. Some cause warts on the feet. Some cause genital warts. Some cause genital warts and cervical cancer. There's, there's only two strains, maybe three, that cause uh, cervical cancer. Serotypes 16, 18, and probably 31. Those are the only strains that the Gardasil protects against. It doesn't protect against other strains of HPV. Yeah. It doesn't protect against strains of HPV that cause warts on your hand. Why not? Well, we don't care about warts on the hand. We don't care about warts in general. We care about the cervical cancer. That's what the protection is against. That's why there's not um, they're not working on some sort of magical um, <coughs> vaccine against gonorrhea because you can protect yourself against gonorrhea pretty simply. Don't have intercourse with people who have gonorrhea. Wow. Pretty simple. How will you know? You like, just don't. No, I don't know. Well. See, look at these kind of a lot of on. See these warts? Mm -hmm. Notice that you don't have like redness around them or anything like that. They're just sort of flesh colored. That's how you can tell the difference both times. And you see them a lot around the uh, anus. Yeah. In, um, oh, there's a lot. In gay men. Oh in the. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ew. You ruined my life. Get out. <laughs> you know how many people have HPV? A lot of the uh, HPV is very, very common. So but again, but again, understand this. You're, you're missing the point. Not all HPV causes general warts. There's a hundred different strains of it. Only about five of them actually cause general warts. Only about three of those actually cause cervical cancer. So yeah, a lot of people have HPV, but they have warts on their hands or warts on their foot, someplace else in their body. It has nothing to do with genitals. And you don't have to have sex to get HPV. Um, Again, it depends on the strains, because again, you can get you know, a hand from hand to hand con you know, contact. So yeah, it's simple. But general warts like these are going to come from having sexual intercourse, or at least general general contact. This is the picture I want you to have in your head forever. Oh, that's why I left it up on the board. Take the picture and send it to my daughter. She won't be locked. Girl, I took her to the hospice. Why? Don't you uh, get a shot for this? They got vaccinations. Yeah, you know, because yeah, I got one. That you don't want us today. Well, you just checked out. The still does not protect against all the strength of HPV. Oh, so it's only meant to protect against the strains that cause cervical cancer. Because uh, that's all we care about. I want to be one less. <laughs> what is it called again? Tri trichomoniasis. Trichomoniasis. It's caused by a protozoan called Trichomonas vaginalis. Look how cute. Interesting. That's the right, that's the normal one? Oh, that's not. See how cute that is? No. Yeah. Oh. And look at the white blood cells showing up. It's a beautiful It's scary right there. there. Now, can you really get this off of a toilet seat? No. I'm saying this comes from having sex with somebody who's infected with triple mono's and What is the one that you can get off the toilet seat? Nothing. So, this is strictly in females? 
Well, it is asymptomatic in males. Gotcha. Men don't know they have it. Men don't know they have it. In women, it causes a very obvious odiferous no. odiferous. What's odiferous mean? Stink. Smelly. Sickness. Frothy discharge. Gross. Trash got you. Was frothy. Mean? He said frosty. Frothy. Frosty. What does frothy mean? All I know is I usually use that to describe my Bubbly. Drinks. Oh! oh! And that's what it looks like, right? Yes. It causes hey, yeah. cervix to take on the strawberry appearance. But you wouldn't see that. But you would definitely see the frothy discharge. 